Joining me right now, high-profile lawyer out of Jacksonville, former Fed as an agent with the FBI, and author of Arrest Proof Yourself. You can find him at dalecarsonlaw.com. Dale, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. I'm so mad I could chew a nail in half right now. Chew a nail in half. What they are doing to Bethany Funk, what this woman, not they, Ann C. Taylor, the defense lawyer with the public defender's office, is doing to this surviving victim. Why? Well, obviously, they, as a defense, they're going to get information during a preliminary hearing that will help them prepare for the actual murder trial. But the odd thing for me is that probable cause has already been determined. It was determined when the arrest warrant was signed by the judge. There it is, probable cause. They make the arrest, they bring them back. So this ultimately is an effort to suppress evidence. And the way that would work, in my mind, is they would try to show that the actual issuance of that arrest warrant and ultimately a search warrant was invalid and therefore they can get rid of all the evidence that was discovered when he got home or other places because that was the beginning of the investigation. And if it's a fraudulent affidavit in support of it, they can then argue that the court should ex exclude that testimony. It's the exclusionary rule or, or what we know of as a suppression hearing. But I don't think that's going to go well for them. Candidly, as you know, Individual states are sovereigns, and it wasn't until after the, the 1930-31 in our history that there was a uniform act to allow people to be subpoenaed in connection with a criminal trial. And so before that time, if you went to another state, as the organized crime people did, okay, in Prohibition, you couldn't bring them back. You just step over a state line and you were protected. That state couldn't come and get you, and that changed after prohibition in order to allow the government or the individual states to draw people who had fled the jurisdiction and bring them back in order to testify. But this seems like a real overreach because you got to remember she's only going to be allowed to direct examine her if she were to come back. That's number one. Number two, they're going to have to process this in. Nevada, they're going to have to process there. So there's going to be a court hearing. That court is going to have to be apprised of all of the details of why it is that the defense believes she has information that might exonerate him. I just don't even begin to see how that's possible. She may be able to testify and say, well, look, you know, I, I heard things differently than other people heard them as an effort to get some reasonable doubt plugged into the situation. But the evidence is so damning and so broad that, that I just don't believe that that's going to be an effective mechanism. I do believe that it brings notoriety to the case, like you've said. Okay, let it never be said that I do not have self-control. Because listening to you, Del Carson, I nearly bit my tongue off. Okay? <laughs> you gave me chest pains because almost everything you said is completely irrelevant and has nothing to do with this. I don't know how you managed to work in Moonshiners and the Prohibition Act back in 1930-something to what's happening now almost 100 years later. This is not a motion to suppress. This is not a suppression hearing. What is happening on June 26, unless it gets moved, delayed, or however uh, adjusted, is a preliminary hearing. What is a preliminary hearing? A preliminary hearing, much like grand jury hearing, is a simple charging mechanism. This is not a jury trial where the defense can bring on their witnesses and question witnesses by the state and must prove or want to prove they're not guilty. All right. That's not what this is. This is simply where a judge or a magistrate, which is a baby judge, listens to a couple of witnesses by the state, like you said, much like in a search warrant, and they think, okay, yeah, there's a question of fact, which is the sole promise of the jury. The state says Koberger's DNA was found at the scene on a knife sheath. Koberger says, I'm not guilty. I wasn't there. Even if Bethany Funk testified, 
I didn't see a thing. Still, that's a question of fact. His DNA is at the scene. His cell phone puts him at the scene. He had prior relation online trying to reach one of these girls. And he says he's not guilty. Who's telling the truth? That's a question of fact. It goes to a jury. It's really simple. The state could probably get by just putting up one witness, a lead detective. Yeah, they can talk about everything that happened in the case. But they may not be that uh, stupid. There's really no way to put that other than stupid because once you get the lead detective on the stand, he can be cross-examined right. about everything. And then that's, right. that's basically that's right. a practice for the defense. They need to put that's up right. isolated couple of isolated witnesses. So that's what a preliminary Under hearing is. Wait a minute, Dale Carson. Yes, ma'am. The defense just hears these witnesses and it gets bound over for trial. That is when the defense could appropriately subpoena an out-of-state witness. But in the, here, in the motion, Dale Carson, you've done this many times before, you have to domesticate the subpoena, the out-of-state subpoena, which they did not do because under Idaho law and Nevada law, you have to have a hearing to show that the witness's testimony is material, important, critical. Here, all that Ann C. Taylor's motion says is she might have material evidence. They haven't had the hearing. So they flubbed. They screwed up on so many levels, much less they can't even spell the victim's name right. But I don't, this isn't worth the, the paper it's printed on, Dale Carson, because obviously Ann Taylor doesn't know the legal steps for an out-of-state subpoena.